What's going on guys, my name is Matt and because of the current GPU shortages, many people are turning to pre-builds as a way of upgrading or even getting into PC gaming for the first time. While some pre-builds offer a good value per dollar, most of the budget systems should be avoided. A week or so ago while browsing Amazon, I stumbled across a listing for a $600 pre-build that actually was a decent deal on paper. It's an HP system with a 1650 Super and an Intel 10th gen CPU. With this being said, specs don't tell the whole story of a system, so I decided to pick one up, test it out, and show you guys if it's worth it or not. So I ordered the system with Prime shipping and it arrived at my door two days later. But before we crack into this box, talk about specs, and test it out, I first want to take a minute to talk about the sponsor of today's video, Corsair, and their new K65 Mini. The K65 Mini takes many of the features of Corsair's legendary keyboards and packs them into a compact 60% layout. This board checks all of my boxes for a good keyboard, including solid build quality, double shot PBT keycaps, high quality Cherry MX switches, and the list goes on. It uses a detachable braided USB-C cable, and the thing that really sets this board apart is the lighting. With dynamic per key RGB lighting and complete customization through IQ, the K65 Mini offers the best lighting in a board of this size. To learn more about the K65 Mini and to pick one up for yourself, head to the link in the description. So with that done, let's go ahead and get back to this pre-build. When this arrived, I first noticed how the box was pretty compact and felt surprisingly light for a fully built system. Opening it up, the first thing I was greeted with is this brown box, which contains the included keyboard and I'll talk about this more later. Then I pulled out this bag with some documents, the power cable, and a mouse. After that, all that was left was the system itself. The protective packaging was this formed cardboard which while somewhat unusual for a desktop it did get the job done. Getting the system itself out I was again surprised at how compact it was and was pretty impressed with its looks. Sure it's no tricked out full glass system with RGB but compared to a lot of old HP and Dell systems of the past this thing actually looks pretty sleek and clean. Being the hardware nerd I am I wanted to open it up before even turning it on. To get inside all you have to do is remove one screw with either a Torx bit or a blade screw screwdriver. Oddly, a Phillips head won't do the job in this case. Pulling this panel off, I found a pretty compact and clean layout. Removing the screw here allows the panel to pull off and then popping off the front panel and removing this screw here allows the drive cage to come out and gives us an unrestricted view of the internals, which means it's the perfect time to talk about the specs. For the CPU in this system, it's using an Intel Core i3-10100. This is a decent choice in my opinion and makes sense at this budget. The i3-10100 is a 4-core, 8-thread CPU running on Intel's Comet Lake architecture. This chip has a base and boost clock of 3.6 and 4.3 GHz respectively and has a rated TDP of 65 watts, making it decently power efficient. This CPU is plenty powerful for modern gaming, but if you're wanting to stream or do video editing, you may want to go for a chip with a bit more power. To cool this CPU, HP used a basic OEM heatsink. This is basically just a hunk of aluminum with a fan attached. It's nothing special, but does get the job done, and you'll be able to see specific temps during the benchmark section of this video. The motherboard being used is this weird proprietary board, which looks like an extended micro ATX board. Again, it's proprietary, but it does have some neat features. In terms in terms of RAM, the system has 8GB which is adequate for most PC games but not ideal and what's even less ideal is the fact that it's a single stick kit. This means no dual channel operation which can have an impact on performance and got me thinking as to what the performance difference would be going from a single 8GB stick to two of them. This stick in particular is a Samsung module rated at 3200MHz which is good to see it's over the 2666MHz that the 10100 supports up to. There are only two slots on this motherboard which does hinder upgradability a bit but isn't a deal breaker to me. To the right of the DIMM slots are two M.2 slots, one for the pre-installed Wi-Fi card and one for the pre-installed SSD. This SSD is a Western Digital SM530 which from my understanding is an OEM version of the SN550 which is considered a solid budget boot drive. The WD SM530 is an NVMe drive that offers great performance for a budget system like this one. It doesn't have DRAM which is less of an issue on an NVMe drive compared to a SATA drive, and this uses TLC flash. One big downside is this is only a 240GB drive. I think this is a fine starting point being able to hold your OS. 
applications, and a few of your most played games as long as those games aren't COD Warzone. With this being said, the case does come with an open 3.5 inch drive bay with pre-routed cables, so throwing in a large mechanical drive would be both easy and inexpensive. One other thing to mention about this is I don't think the system comes with the screws to install another drive, so keep that in mind. For the graphics card, this PC is actually using an NVIDIA GTX 1650 Super, which is an awesome budget graphics card, being able to play pretty much anything you throw at it at 1080p, 60fps, adjusting the settings accordingly. In terms of cooler designs, this is about as basic as it gets being an unbranded OEM card with a full aluminum heatsink and no backplate, and honestly that's fine because you never see the card and the cooler does an adequate job of keeping temps in check. This card does require a 6-pin PCI connector, which the PSU does have. Speaking of the power supply, this is an area where things get very proprietary. The system uses what I think is a TFX size unit, which is unpainted and HP branded. One interesting thing is this seems to be a pretty high quality unit with an 80 plus gold efficiency rating. It has 400 watts of power and a weird cable layout. This unit has a standard 6 plus 2 pin PCIe connector, 2 SATA power cables, and then 4 4 pin connectors that go to the motherboard. This means without some sort of adapter or modification, a standard power supply will not work with this system. With that being said, 400 watts is more than enough for this PC and is even enough for an upgrade to something like an i5 10400F and an RTX 3060 which will stay well under that 400 watt rating even at full load. All of these parts are inside of the OEM HP case and there is a single 90mm case fan which works fine. So now that you know what's on the inside of the system, let's take a quick look at the outside of the system. The front has this angular slash textured line design which looks pretty nice along with a mirrored finish HP logo and an Intel case badge. The front panel also has a good portion of the system's I.O. with a power button, headphone mic combo port, four USB 3 ports, an SD card slot, and a USB-C port. Now, interestingly, unlike traditional front panel I.O., these ports are all attached directly to the motherboard. One other thing to note is the front has almost no ventilation with only a few slits at the top. With this being said, looking at the side panel, we see a blank black metal sheet with a good amount of ventilation which acts as passive intake for the system and seems to work out well. The back is also kind of interesting. Going from top to bottom, we find headphone and mic ports, a covered HDMI port, another covered port that says do not remove which I'll talk about in a minute, 4 USB 2 ports and gigabit ethernet, the graphics card supports DVI, HDMI, and DisplayPort, and the only other port on the back is for the ATX power cord. Now under the do not remove cover, there's actually a VGA port that works but for some reason they don't want you to use it. The HDMI port on the motherboard also works and my only guess for why they covered these up is to ensure people use the video output on the graphics card and not the motherboard. This is important as you won't be able to take advantage of the GPU's power if you're not outputting video from it. The top and back panel are just made of a single piece of curved metal and the bottom just has stamped out metal feet with rubber on them to protect the surface you set the system on. All in all, after getting my hands on and inside this guy, I was pretty impressed at what is available for $600, especially considering the current market. But as most of you know, specs aren't everything and at the end of the day, the experience this system provides is what's most important. So I went ahead and plugged in a keyboard, mouse, ethernet, HDMI, and power. Then I hit the power button to start it up for the first time. Booting it up, you can see there's this pretty good looking green LED glow at the front bottom of the case. And once booted up, I was brought to this Windows setup screen where I just went through and got the PC settings to my liking. Once in Windows, I first looked to see if there was much bloatware on it. Some questionable stuff included apps like Booking.com, ExpressVPN, lots of HP branded apps, wild tangent games, and the most concerning ones being the few McAfee antivirus programs which I promptly uninstalled. One thing nice about pre-builds is that all the drivers come pre-installed, but looking at the Windows updates there were an absolute butt ton, and the version of Windows it shipped with was 19041.488 from over 6 months ago. When checking the Nvidia drivers, I found ones that were over a year old, but luckily these quickly auto-updated to the latest version without me doing anything. While all these driver updates were installing, I did what I should have done at the very beginning, which is the most important setup step for any Windows system, which is installing Chrome and ditching Microsoft Edge. With all the drivers updated, I did a quick reboot, logged in, and was met with this. 
A black screen with my mouse cursor, I could control alt delete to pull up task manager or log out, but couldn't get into windows. I tried a whole bunch of stuff, but nothing worked, and after over an hour of troubleshooting, I gave up and decided to just install a fresh version of Windows 10. Doing this and installing new drivers took less than an hour, and honestly, I recommend it if you do pick up one of these systems. So just keep in mind, this is a new install of Windows. With that all done, I could start to download and test some games. Now when going into testing, I wanted to see stock performance then show you how I might upgrade it for under $100 and see if there's any performance increase. Going into testing my biggest concern was how the system would perform with only a single 8GB stick of RAM. Many people make single channel RAM seem like a huge issue and others brush it off like it's no big deal so I was excited to see how the system would fare. One other thing to note is that this is running these games with nothing in the background so throwing in stuff like Discord, Spotify, and a few Chrome tabs could have an effect on performance. I tested a bunch of games both popular and hard to run and if there's other games you want to see tested let me know what they are in the comments below. So without further ado let me show you this system's stock performance. Let's start things off with Borderlands 3 at 1080p medium settings. Using the built-in benchmark the system put out a 65 FPS average with 1% lows of 35. This is decent performance and shows that this PC can handle AAA titles at 1080p with a 60 plus FPS average. Next up is Rainbow Six Siege at 1080p very high settings using the built-in benchmark. Doing this resulted in a 180 FPS average with 1% lows of 115 which is decent performance. For Doom Eternal at 1080p medium and in-game the system put out an 83 FPS average with 1% lows of 50. For Apex Legends at 1080p medium this system had an 81 FPS average with 1% lows of 52. In Fortnite at 1080p Pro settings, I wasn't super impressed with the system's performance in a Team Rumbles match, which had an average of 102 FPS and 1% lows of 46. In Far Cry 5 at 1080p medium with the built-in benchmark, the system put out an average of 69 FPS with 1% lows of 36. And finally in Shadow the Tomb Raider at 1080p medium, the system put out a 59 FPS average with 1% lows of 28 in the built-in benchmark. Overall, I was pretty happy with stock performance. Most of these games ran pretty smoothly and all of them were around 60 FPS or higher on average. With all this being said, for around $60 to $100 you could make this system much more well rounded and even possibly increase performance a bit. The two areas I would upgrade would be RAM and storage. Again the system has a single 8GB stick of DDR4 and grabbing a second 8GB stick would both double the capacity and the memory bandwidth. I would recommend getting an 8GB stick with speeds of at least 2666MHz which should be easy to find for under $40. I decided to use this 8GB stick of OLED RAM that runs at 2666MHz CL16, which I got for around $35. To install this, I just opened up the side panel, opened up the clips on the RAM slot, lined up the notch, and pressed it into place. Booting the system up, we can see there is now 16GB of RAM. The second upgrade I would make is to storage. My recommendation would be a 2TB Seagate Barracuda drive which you can get for $50 to $55 and offers a ton of storage for the money. If you are very strapped for cash and you will only use the drive for games and no super important files, then going for a 1TB white label drive for $30 would also be a decent option and would keep the total cost of both upgrades to $65. You could also add another SSD but for a budget system like this I think a mechanical drive will work work well and I will link these options down below. Either way, to install the drive you have to remove the drive cage by taking off the side panel, removing this screw and metal piece, pop open the front panel to unscrew this screw and pop out the drive cage, then you can attach the drive with some M3 screws that you will have to buy separately and then plug in the SATA power and data and then finally put everything back into the case. When booting the system up, your drive may not show up in Windows, but don't panic, just go to Disk Management, right click on your new drive and select Create New Simple Volume, go through the setup to name and create your drive, and then boom, you'll have a bunch of storage for all of your games and other large files. Now obviously, upgrading your storage isn't going to have an impact on performance in 99% of cases, but the RAM upgrade could possibly have an effect on performance, and because of this, I want to see if rerunning the test would show any differences. And Boy oh boy was I surprised at the results. 
Starting off with Borderlands 3, with the extra 8GB I saw an 18% increase in average FPS from 65 to 77, but the bigger increase in 1% lows where I saw an over 50% increase from 35 to 54, and this was not an outlier. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider, the average went from 59 to 80, and the 1% lows went from 28 to 45. In Rainbow Six, there was an average jump from 180 to 218, and 1% lows jumped from 115 to 160, and the story continues from Far Cry 5 to Doom Eternal to even Fortnite and Apex Legends. All these titles saw noticeable performance uplifts. Again, the biggest difference came in the 1% lows. While average FPS didn't show a massive change, the big 1% low changes resulted in smoother gameplay with less stutters and overall just a better and more polished gaming experience. All in all, this $35 RAM upgrade was very well worth it, and if you have a pre-built like this one, then going from single to dual channel and 8 to 16GB is something I highly, highly recommend. There's still a few things to discuss before we wrap the video up. The first is the included peripherals. The keyboard and mouse that come with this system are not very good. The keyboard is a basic full-size membrane keyboard which honestly would work fine, but the mouse is very hard to use for gaming. It's not awful for casual play, but with no size side buttons, it makes it unusable for me personally. Finally, let's talk about temps. While gaming, the GPU stayed in the mid to upper 70s most of the time, and the CPU stayed in the low to mid 60s most of the time. These temps are perfectly acceptable in my opinion, but putting more powerful hardware in this case could pose a potential for overheating. Overall, for $600, this system offers some decent performance. The problems I ran into with the OS were disappointing, but I would think that's something that's not very common. Again, if you pick up one of these systems, definitely upgrade the RAM and consider upgrading the storage. So to answer the question, do I think this system is worth it? For $600, taking into account the current state of things with the PC hardware market, I do think this is worth it. You're getting a good system that can play pretty much any game at 1080p, 60fps. It comes with a warranty, and overall, it's a pretty good value. So yeah guys, I think this wraps this video up. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to give this video a thumbs up and consider subscribing. And as always, this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.